Everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of GSO Ocean Classroom Live. How fun this is that our 10th episode is today on September 10th. Uh, hello to all of our audiences out there, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and then Periscope through Twitter. Um, and always thank you to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation for its generous support in funding today's episode. So my name is Holly Morin. Uh, I am a marine biologist and science communicator with the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. And I'm back today as your host. Uh, just because our hosts have changed up a little bit, thank you, Alex, for doing such a great job with our three previous episodes on sharks. Uh, but just because we've switched up our hosts doesn't mean the flavor of these programs has changed at all. So I want you all to remember out there that you are uh, very important to this program and we're keeping things super conversational. So you can ask a question at any time and that's gonna be really important to the success of today's program. So you're gonna go ahead and you can ask questions right there in the comment box that's underneath the Facebook video player or in the YouTube chat box as well. And we'll get to as many of those questions today as possible. Also remember to follow uh, the Inner Space Center as well as URI GSO on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. You can uh, like or um, you can uh, so that you can follow along with those pages and stay up to date on these episodes as well as future programming as well. So our previous episodes were focused on sharks, and today we're going to pivot away from those fascinating creatures, and we're actually going to go completely away from animals that have backbones. Uh, we're going to talk about shellfish today, uh, the estuarine environment they live in, and then the important roles both uh, these invertebrates as well as the special habitats they live in, the roles they play in ocean health. So really quickly, an estuary. What is an estuary? Simply put, it's where salt water meets fresh water. So Narragansett Bay here in Rhode Island is actually a fantastic example of an estuary. And I think we might have a map. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Uh, this is one of New England's largest estuaries, uh, and it has about 196 square miles of estuarine water. So that includes Rhode Island and neighboring Massachusetts. So you have salt water from the Atlantic Ocean, uh, which is to the southeast coast, actually, of Rhode Island. And then you have freshwater inputs from the Seconic River. You have Mount Hope Bay. You even have waters from the Taunton River in Massachusetts coming into the area. Over 3,500 miles of streams and, uh, and rivers are actually carrying water, fresh water, into the bay. And then, of course, it opens up into the Atlantic Ocean. A salt marsh is also another great example of an estuary or a mangrove. Uh, for those of you that don't live in Rhode Island, uh, maybe you visited one this summer. I bet you if you went to the coast uh, any time during the summer this year, you probably encountered some type of estuary. So the other player in our story for today, for our story today is shellfish. So what are shellfish? Simply put, these are invertebrates, animals that don't have a backbone, uh, that have an exoskeleton. There's another really great word. So this means a hard outer shell. Uh, and these usually include aquatic animals or invertebrates that humans like to eat. So I bet you all, there are some of you out there that I bet like to eat uh, invertebrates. So I'm gonna throw it out there. What do you think? What are some shellfish that you think uh, that you eat that are common? Give you all a second to think about it. What are shellfish that you all like to eat? I know personally, I can tell you, I like to eat clams. Nobody else in my family eats clams, just me. <laughs> Anybody out there? Crawdads, crawfish, yes, perfect, Chris Harwood. That's a great one, crawfish. And then if you wanna make them a, a little bit bigger, you got lobsters, that's another type of shellfish, definitely. And then you also have mussels, we have oysters. Um, 
uh, crabs as well. Um, those are another type. I know a lot of people eat blue crabs, especially along the mid-Atlantic coast. So lots of interesting species that live in these estuaries and our content expert today can actually share more information about these shellfish and the estuarine environment they live in. So that is Ed Baker. He is the facility manager of GSO's Marine Research Aquarium. So hi, Ed, welcome to today's program. Say hello to our audiences out there and tell them a little bit more about yourself. Well, thank you, Holly. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Marine Science Research Facility located at URI's Bay Campus. We're on the West Passage of Narragansett Bay. And uh, I've been working at the um, MSRF for uh, 15 years or so, something like that. Before that, I worked at the National Marine uh, Fisheries Center across the street. And then before that, the School for Marine Science and Technology in New Bedford, Mass, where they also had a wet lab facility. Um, Today, we're gonna to be talking about filter feeders and the role of a healthy estuary. Um, one thing I guess I should touch upon is the uh, remarkable diversity of research we do here at the MSRF. And we have researchers that study everything from benthic soil chemistry to lobster neuropeptides, aquatic feeds for aquaculture. Um, we have a host of um, researchers working on solving a disease problem in oysters. And uh, we may talk about that a little bit later on. But um, we can accommodate almost any marine research except for vastness and depth. Uh, we can emulate conditions in Antarctica or in the tropic and any salinity. Um, a lot of folks are interested in CO2 and the, the rising CO2 in the atmosphere and its effect on ocean acidification. Um, people don't know this, but uh, CO2 dissolves very readily into the seawater. And one of the great things we demonstrate here to classrooms is that if you exhale through an air stone in a beaker of seawater, and if that beaker has a pH meter in it, you can drop that pH reading one whole point from say seven to six with a single breath. So it's pretty impressive that CO2 has that effect on seawater. I think it's great too that you guys are doing some of that uh, research or that you've looked into those different factors that change things up um, for different species um, in, in different waters or different environments. So I think we're going to get into a little bit more about the facility in just one second, but thank you, Ed. I know that other people had some ideas for shellfish that they like to eat. Ed, actually, what is your favorite type of shellfish? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, an allergy. I'm actually a soft shell clam guy, and I actually really like going to dig clams. That's a fun pastime and uh, puts you out in the marshes and uh, at low tide and it's a very interesting place. So what did other folks think out there either in Facebook, YouTube or out in Twitter? Mussels, yes, those are very good, especially with um, some pasta, scallops as well. This is gonna make me really hungry around lunchtime. This is definite. Oysters, yes, on the half shell for sure. This is all great. You guys are great with your answers. You definitely know your shellfish. And again, now I am hungry. So a little bit more about the um, Marine Research Facility. But again, if you all have questions, uh, definitely keep typing those in, just like you typed in those answers um, to my question about different types of shellfish. Any question that you might have, uh, we'll definitely get those today, whether it's about Ed or maybe my science background, the Marine Research Facility that we're going to get into a little bit more now. When, once we get into estuaries and the shellfish that live there, anything that you guys might want to chat about or have a question, feel free. Um, so the Marine Research Facility, we showed some of the tanks, um, which is great. And I know it's this building. So you're actually in one of the other labs, but the Marine Research Facility, it's actually a complex of four different buildings. Um, and like you said, you can basically emulate any type of um, uh, ocean parameter, except for how deep it goes and the, the vastness of the ocean. But the thing that I always find is very interesting, too, is it's not just the water tanks that always have very interesting critters. You also have freezers at the facility that the scientists can have access to. What are the freezers for, Ed? Yeah, so we actually have a, a deep freeze freezer, minus 20 degrees Celsius, which is like Antarctica. And uh, mostly researchers store samples in there. It's not actively used for research. The environmental chambers, however, um, can go to minus four Celsius, which is can be the temperature of seawater at either pole, um, and up to say 24 degrees Celsius, which would be uh, the warmest here in Narragansett Bay. Um, those researchers are primarily interested in maintaining a temperature that's suitable for their organisms. For example, the minus two and minus four, uh, rather the two Celsius and four Celsius chambers both host uh, 
phytoplankton researchers who are working on solving problems with algae at the poles, specifically mm -hmm. Antarctica, the Great Southern Ocean. And it's sort of funny, the, uh, one of the things, here's a 40 micron sieve, and you can see how fine it is on the bottom. And the researchers are studying organisms that would pass through that screen. In fact, many of them are 10 to 20 microns in diameter. And it's hard to visualize that uh, given they're microscopic, but some people have had the experience of seeing fog droplets at night by the porch light suspended in the air. Those are generally thought to be two microns. So if you've ever had that experience, times that times five, uh, and you have a 10 micron phytoplankton cell. Combined, all phytoplankton in the ocean, the world's oceans, equal the biomass of all land plants, all trees, shrubs, and grasses, which is just incredible. And fully half of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. So in marine biology, the small stuff matters, it's very important. That they do. And so do the animals that don't move around very quickly either, right, Ed? So the things that are in the tanks right now at the Marine Research Facility, you have blue lobsters, I believe, um, at the facility right now. There's one. So, Ed, tell us about these lobsters. Why are they blue? And then you have them in individual buckets. Why are they in buckets at the facility? Sure. They're, uh, the wild, uh, blue lobsters found in the wild are about one in two million. So they're extraordinarily rare. And uh, they're an incredible color that you don't expect to see in nature or coming out of the sea. Um, we keep them separately because they're, they're, uh, they're cannibals. They, they will attack each other and they're very aggressive towards each other. Um, so to keep them alive, we, uh, we keep them in individual um, containers like what you're seeing now. Um, there are a couple of other variations in lobster color. It's a mutation in the pigment that's expressed on the shell, the exoskeleton that Holly mentioned earlier. Um, there's even a niftier one, and we should have probably got one online, but you can have a lobster where exactly one half of it is blue and the other half is a normal color. And what's fascinating about that is the mutation happens at first cleavage. So if you guys have ever done any biology, it's the egg is fertilized and it's one cell, then two cells. One of those cells has the mutation for the blue pigment and the other cell has a normal pigmentation and everything from the right side is blue and everything on the left side is normal right from the tip of the rostrum a straight line all the way back to the tail and those are found at about one in 50 million wow that's awesome i see this is when i think invertebrates shelf i know everyone gets excited about whales and sharks but man the ones without a backbone those animals they're small yeah. but mighty and really truly fascinating so um i want to remind everybody out there if you have questions definitely type them in i have another question for you ed um and that is i know that in addition to lobsters you also have that infamous or not infamous clam that was um it was dug up or caught by uh, a young man a couple of weeks ago made the news whoever knew it uh a shellfish could make such a splash har 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 in the news so what's the story behind this this quahog, um, it, it perhaps the largest one that's ever been collected in Rhode Island uh, waters, right? It is, Holly, it is the largest one, and it's a wonderful story. Cooper Murano was uh, clamming with his grandfather down in Weekapog in Westerly. He's from South Kingstown. And uh, he's down on his hands and knees, which is uh, really important to this story. He's feeling along and he feels this rock-like structure under the mud, but he feels that it has an edge. And so he starts pulling at it and digging it, digging away at it and discovers it's this gigantic clam. And he holds it up and he says, look, everyone. And uh, he, uh, his, he saved it from his mom who wanted to cook it for chowder and uh, gave us a call here at, at the Marine Science Research Facility. We, we, uh, we definitely wanted to keep it for display. Um, interestingly, you can see on the outside of the shell scrape marks these are from we think these are from previous shell fishermen that weren't on their hands and knees but rather using a rake and they actually raked over the shell scraping it but the clam is so massive it did not become dislodged and so it stayed put for years and years and only by someone on hands and knees feeling with their hands would it have been discovered it's really marvelous so on the size issue the largest size that the 
Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management has recorded in their clam survey is 72 millimeter hinge height. So the hinge height is like if you lay it on the table, how fat is it? Um, and Cooper's is uh, 80 millimeters, significantly bigger than the previous record. So it's likely to stand for quite some time. And it weighs, and it's, I, if I remember correctly, it's about six inches across. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. It weighs over two pounds, almost. You know, it's like almost that. three pounds. Yeah. It's like yeah. two yeah. and three quarters pounds. Yes. That's a really, that's just a giant. I mean, I know giant clams obviously exist or whatever, but that is just, I can't imagine pulling something out of um, the, the sediments that size, let alone if I, like, I think of my nine year old son, if he pulled something out like that, it would just be, it must have been such an experience for him to oh, make that discovery. Thank you. And he got his black belt that day too. So. Oh, there we go. Perfect. What a way, what a way to celebrate, right? We'll bring that in here. So we're celebrating estuaries today. Um, and so talking about clams, I know there's also the oyster research ed that you mentioned as well that um, is happening where they're looking at a, a parasite um, that is impacting oysters in the area. Oysters are actually really critical when we're thinking about estuaries. They're super interesting animals and in how quickly they can actually filter water out. Um, they can, if I remember correctly, they filter out like 50 gallons in one day. Um, and they're basically bringing water into their bodies and then they're passing it back out, catching food and other particles as that water passes through their bodies. Um, but before we get into the oysters, let's go and back to estuaries and share a little bit more knowledge about that special environment where salt water is meeting um, fresh water. And it's very dynamic. It's going to change with tides. There's changes in temperature. Um, there's changes in salinity as waters warm up and you have evaporation. So waters become more salty or if there's rainwater, more fresh water comes into the system and it becomes less saline or less, um, there's less salt content. So um, Ed, these estuaries, why are they so important? What makes them special? Well, they, they are one of the densest in, in biodiversity one of the densest ecosystems in biodiversity on the planet. And it's because of all these mixing sort of features and nutrient rich waters um, and a killer food base. Uh, the phytoplankton I was talking about earlier uh, is very rich here. So those tiny phytoplankton that I mentioned earlier are the base of the food web for the world's oceans. More specifically in the estuaries, we have all these filter feeders and filter feeders are usually sessile or stationary. Some of the only ones that are not are scallops. They're filter feeders and they can swim a little bit. But normally you have to picture a clam has an in pipe and an out pipe and they actually draw water with the phytoplankton and other sediment into their bodies and it actually, they actually have a specialized mouth that sorts the particles and can detect a good particle from a bad particle. So it will eat the phytoplankton that's nutritious and grow and the piece of silt or something that's inorganic or some other material they don't want, they can actually put that into a mucus string or a mucus pellet and expel it later on. This all serves the purpose of clearing and cleaning the water though, which is super important for a healthy estuary. The, um, the clear water in turn begets wonderful eelgrass beds. And these are these marvelous single strand long grasses up to three feet long. And they're like a jungle for little creatures. So they can go in there and hide and they can also find food in there, but the, mostly they're protected from the bigger fish, the predators. And so the eelgrass serves as a nursery for small fish, it's the fish that we catch all the time, things like striped bass, black sea bass, tatog, summer flounder, all of these wonderful fish and so this is a very simple analogy of connecting the relationship between organisms where filter feeders clear the water and grow. The clear water in turn is great for things like eelgrass beds, which are so important for finfish nurseries. And then you think about the, if you go to those top level, top level predators where the fish themselves are trying to hide from them, but if you think about wading birds, that's another area of diversity, maybe not in the water, but above the water, you're gonna have ospreys, herons, egrets, and a whole host of other birds um, that are in this environment and thriving because like you said, it's so rich and diverse and there is so much food available, not only to predators that might be fish, but to the birds as well. So we have a question. So Arthur is asking, how does runoff containing fertilizers affect filter feeders? That's a fantastic question because I always tell people that estuaries or salt marshes are kind of like 
sponges or kidneys that they filter things out and then they lock them into the sediments. But how does that run off? So if it has fertilizer or other pollutants that might be coming upstream, when it flows into the estuary, the filter feeders access these while they're filter feeding, you know, how does that impact them, Ed? Oh, so that's an excellent question, Arthur. They, um, it's, uh, it affects them in many ways. Um, the fertilizer can often be uptake taken by both phytoplankton, which is food for the shellfish and other filter feeders, or by the macroalgae that you see as seaweed washed up on the beach. That can be more problematic as you have massive macroalgae blooms that eventually die off. That is material for the decomposing bacteria. The decomposing bacteria uses oxygen in the estuaries and can um, sometimes draw down the oxygen levels. Um, Outside of that, um, any kind of particulates that are in the incoming water that might contain fertilizer uh, will either settle out, just fall by gravity to the bottom as the water slows down entering the estuary, or it will be strained out by plant material that's in the water column that just sort of slows the water flow down so things kind of strain out. Or as we talked about earlier, filter filtered by filter feeders. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast, right? Yeah. Uh, so it looks like we have another follow-up question. I love this. Um, so Olga would like to know what becomes of those expelled pellets that you mentioned, Ed? Yeah, Olga, that's fascinating. You may have heard of uh, oceanic snow with material falling from the, from the top down to the bottom, very deep. This is all sort of life at the surface of the ocean. It doesn't live forever and at some point it dies. Well, similarly, Olga, the pellets that uh, the um, filter feeders expel fall to the bottom and there's a steady, constant um, raining of materials down. So ever so slowly, the estuaries are actually filling up. Um, and so the particle that fell there yesterday will be buried in six months to eight months. And then, too, if you think about if you have crabs that are living in the estuary or lobsters, I know lobsters, lobsters tend to be more subtitle, but um, you have those types of animals that are what we call detritivores. And so they're kind of the they're very important. So they're moving around. They're kind of like the, the salt marsh or the estuarine garbage man, for lack of a better description, a very important job to have. But they will pick through things and find things to eat. They'll actually feed upon um, dead and decaying matter. Um, and then uh, they that's another way that they help to clean up um, different um, ocean environments, whether it be an estuarine environment or a subtile environment. They're out there um, picking up those different um, decaying uh, pieces of food as well as scavenging for other things. They're great scavengers. Um, so I think we have another question coming up. And this one actually, we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk about microplastics, Ed. Um, so Sherry would like to know, what about microplastics? Why are some shellfish starting to prefer micro, microplastics versus eating actual plankton? Do they, do they actually prefer microplastics? Yeah, Sherry, thanks for the question. I'm not so sure it's, it's determined that they prefer it. We actually have some researchers online this fall uh, to study just that in oysters. And um, I'm not sure if it's a preference or if it's just, it, it's sort of, uh, eludes their screening process where they say, oh, it's not really food and it's not really something I'm gonna spit out either. So somehow it sneaks in. And uh, in some cases, some shellfish are ingesting plas microplastics, which is, uh, is a concern. Yeah, and I think it might be also something where if you think about sea turtles and that they will ingest plastic bags because it mimics looking like they're jellyfish that they usually eat, or they've actually found sperm whales that have plastic bags, unfortunately, or plastics in their um, stomachs as well, because again, it mimics a squid. So I don't know if they're necessarily like, hey, that piece of plastic looks really tasty. It just may be that it's like you're saying, they can't distinguish it between something that they usually eat and then it gets uh, ingested and then becomes um, absorbed in part of their tissue. This yeah. also happens with shellfish. It's, um, it's like a stealth particle. Yeah. And then it also, um, this is something that happens with shellfish when you think about toxic algae as well. It's not like I don't think they necessarily can tell the difference. I don't know. I'm a vertebrate person, not an invert person. But sometimes there are pieces of plankton or algae, dinoflagellates, if you want to get really specific, that have toxins in them that they will then ingest. And um, over time, they accumulate those toxins in their tissues. And then they don't get sick from them. But if we eat them, humans will actually get sick. And that's why shellfish areas will close down sometimes, right, Ed? 
Yeah, there. That's a bioaccumulation of uh, marine phytotoxins, and uh, it's definitely a wild west of um, chemistry. Um, the, I love uh, that. <laughs> the the uh, and and some of it's deadly. It's it's not it's not uh, a light matter. But the um, the interesting thing, back sort of to the plastics and stealth uh, materials and not distinguishing good from bad, uh, that's sort of the hallmark of this oyster research that's going on right now. So what the researchers are looking at are families of oysters. So they've taken oysters from Maine, the Cape, Rhode Island, Delaware, Virginia, and they are uh, exposing them to this pathogen, dermo. And what they're finding is, is that some oyster families actually can taste the dermo and then close up and stop filter feeding. So they don't get contaminated. They stay healthy. Other families don't really recognize that it's a, a bad thing and keep on feeding and they get sick. And so what, uh, what they're hoping to do is find the, the genetics in the families that can detect dermo and amplify that in the wild so that the wild oysters do well and the aquaculture oysters do well. Wow, that's fascinating. And how long has that research um, been go either been going on for or how long is that project? It's about a month. It'll go for another month or so. Yeah. Okay. And uh, okay. by the way, we are the founding institution for Rhode Island's oyster aquaculture industry. Um, the, the research that all went into how to spawn, how to culture and grow small oysters all took place here at the Bay Campus. Fantastic. And of course, um, oysters are incredibly important to not only filtering out and providing or bettering water quality and clarity, but also they provide nice hard substrate for other critters to attach to or live within. So um, I was going to actually ask you a question about what threatens estuaries, but I think we actually have somebody else with that similar question, which is fantastic. Thank you. So uh, Molly wants to know, what role does erosion contribute to the health of a tidal estuary? Great question, Molly. Yes, uh, erosion is can be significant. Um, we actually have invasive uh, crabs that are terrible for the marshes. I'm actually not really up on that. I should be no more. But they um, they actually mine and excavate in the marsh mud and kill the plant material above the the Spartina grasses, and they uh, sort of start to erode the marshes. So that's an example of a beautiful, healthy marsh at high tide. Um, and uh, so erosion is a big deal. Um, if you if you overwhelm a, an estuary with sediment, you'll smother mm -hmm. organisms, which is a significant uh, threat. Um, and as as we talked about before, nutrients uh, really pose a threat, especially if you have these massive macroalgae blooms that um, eventually perish and fall to the bottom. There's a great aerial photo of phytoplankton in the water, and you can see the greens. Those are trillions of cells of photosynthetic phytoplankton. Yeah, and then another threat to them as well is, is development. And that's kind of twofold where you are losing that precious land that's so important to act as nursery grounds, a hurricane barrier, potentially a filter for pollutants. But then any pollutants that have been locked in those sediments of the estuaries will be essentially released back out. Um, so um, it's one thing to definitely to think about. And then really quickly, I saw hypoxia actually go up along the ticker. And that's when you were talking about um, uh, when the, the system gets overwhelmed per se um, and what can actually go wrong. And so if a system, so obviously all these fishes and invertebrates, shellfish, et cetera, they're using oxygen uh, as an energy source to respire, to uh, survive. And, but you can actually lose the oxygen in these marsh environments or in these estuarine environments, correct, Ed? And then when you have no oxygen, terrible things happen. Yeah, so we're actually right on the cusp of that right now. We have a big rain event coming. It's the warmest, temp <laughs> big, warmest temperature of the year. Um, luckily, we have wind tomorrow. But if we had all those conditions um, persist for any amount of time, a huge rain event at the warmest time of year means that fresh water flows into the top of the estuary and fresh water is less dense than seawater. So it flows on the surface and is sort of a barrier for oxygen from the atmosphere to get into the estuary water. This barrier just keeps on flowing and flowing 24 seven. And if there's no wind, it persists for a couple of days and it essentially limits the oxygen that can go into the estuary water. So 
when the sun goes down and photosynthesis stops, photosynthesis, you might remember, produces oxygen in the presence of light. Um, when the sun goes down, everything, all organisms in the water are using oxygen. So that's all the bacteria on the bottom, all the clams, all the fish, everything. And so you can see here, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to do that right now, but the, um, the, uh, so the, the, uh, the perfect storm is warm temperature. Everybody's at their highest metabolism using the most oxygen possible. Um, and then a huge rain event with no wind. And this was a concerted effort by scientists in canoes and little boats out overnight, taking water samples from all levels of the water column and puzzling through this phenomenon. And sure enough, they discovered that at two, three, four in the morning, there's no more oxygen on the bottom of the ocean. And all these creatures start to die. And it's known as a fish kill. It's very unpleasant. East Greenwich is known for them because of the, the way the bay is shaped. And all this dead material is a huge stink bomb on the beach kind of thing. So we try to avoid those uh, with rules and regulations for how much uh, contamination and nutrients can go into the water. Yeah, and that's actually a, a great nod and, and maybe um, a, a, a kind of a homework assignment for folks. This is a classroom event. I know schools are kicking up soon, right? And we usually like to have uh, leave folks with kind of a suggestion of something that they might uh, be able to do on their own. And there is something called the, the it's run by the University of Rhode, uh, Rhode Island. It's the Watershed Watch. And you can actually volunteer to go out and take water samples. Uh, so if you are local to Rhode Island, um, or you may look up, there might be a water monitoring program uh, near you, wherever you may be. Um, and you can go out and take water samples and contribute to this data set that where Ed was talking about folks going out in their canoes, et cetera, which I love, citizen science at its best. Um, but you can just go down. I know they've even been going down to the GSO beach during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've had folks that have volunteered, gone down and monitored that area as well. So that feeds into not only measurements, broad long-term measurements, but it helps uh, beaches be monitored for uh, bacteria and other things that may be uh, gone awry that um, they would need to close the beaches to swimming, et cetera. So there's a little bit of homework you could check out, but otherwise definitely thank an estuary, right, Ed? We want to thank estuaries. We want to thank shellfish, even though they are stationary, uh, but they are still very important. I think, I forget what you had said there. They sit still, but they're critical. I can't remember that you had a really good quote, Ed. Yeah. They, uh, they don't do much movement wise, but they're very important to the health of an estuary and uh, is sort of a link in the food web and the uh, ecosystem of an estuary. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Ed, for reminding that. That was a fantastic connection you made between all of the pieces that were available. So thank you so much, Ed, for joining us today. We really appreciate all of your knowledge and hopefully all of our audiences out there on Facebook, YouTube, uh, on Twitter have learned something new about estuaries and kind of have a new appreciation for shellfish besides how good that they taste mixed with linguine sometimes um, and how important actually these animals are uh, to the health of the ocean as well as uh, estuaries in general. Um, so. Be aware of what you're putting into your water. That's another uh, call to action or a little bit of homework folks can definitely have. Remember that whatever you put into a stream upshore is eventually gonna find its way into an estuary or into the ocean for that matter. So be conscious of plastics, all those different, the microplastics, those break down from bigger pieces um, and get into the water that way. Um, and so thank you again, Ed, for sharing your knowledge. Um, I think that it's been a really great show today. I hope that you all take some time to check out the different links to websites and other programs that have been shared in the various chat boxes. Um, and thank you to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation as well for their support. Um, and thank you to all of you, the audiences out there, for taking time to join us today. We always appreciate you taking time to learn a little bit with us here through these GSO Ocean Classroom events. Make sure you continue to follow along with URI, GSO, and the Interspace Center on social media. Uh, stay tuned for more of these classroom events. We actually have our next one coming up in two weeks. So on September 24th, we'll be talking about hurricanes. And it's actually really relevant. We are in the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season. And as we move into October, that's actually when hurricanes uh, are where the Northeast coast is more at risk um, for hurricanes actually coming up the coast based on where they form. And if you've been following along the National Hurricane Center, it's actually been a very active season thus far. I think we are now into, I forget which letter, P or R, there's only a handful of letters of names left before they start moving into um, the Greek alphabet, start naming their storms. It's been a busy hurricane season for sure. Um, so uh, there'll be a feedback form for all of you to fill out. So if there, are con uh, if there are topics you'd like to have covered through this classroom live event, definitely let 
us know. Otherwise, again, Ed, thanks so much. Thank you to everybody out there. Uh, till then, be well, be safe, celebrate. It's almost the weekend. Happy anniversary, Andrea Dingris, who's behind the scenes 10 years today. Celebrating that. Have a great one, folks. Bye.